producing anything substantial, even as something as simple as a pencil, ultimately requires the cooperation of hundreds of thousands or millions of people. If you trace through everybody involved, that to have a pencil, you need wood. To have wood, you need chainsaws. To have chainsaws, you need steel and gasoline and a variety of other things. Uh, and somebody's got to grow the, the, the trees. And, and that involves a bunch of people. And if you trace back the causal links, even for a pencil and more obviously for an automobile, you realize that somehow, by some magical process, a very large number of people are coordinating their activity to make sure that if someone wants, wants to build cars, because someone wants to drive cars, someone produces enough steel, which means someone has to produce enough iron ore and enough coal, and run down the, down the link. And your first instinct looking at that problem is we must all be dead, because how could you possibly coordinate that many people in order to make the society work? And there are basically two answers to that problem, uh, with many variants of both, of course. The obvious answer is hierarchy. The obvious answer is that you have someone who figures out what everybody should do and makes them do it. And that system works tolerably well for small groups of people, but it doesn't scale very well. That as you increase the size of the hierarchy, uh, the distance between the uh, CEO in the factory floor gets more and more layers of people, and it's harder for him to tell what people are doing or what they ought to be doing. The other and not obvious solution, which is the one that does scale, is decentralized coordination under a system of more or less private property and voluntary trade. And again, there are lots of variants in detail on how it works, different societies, different things category, are categorized as private property. Some things are commons, the air, for example, or the English language, which we don't have intellectual property rights to. But for the most part, uh, you've got a pattern of decentralized coordination. And it's a little puzzling at first how it works. And the full explanation generally takes about a semester or two of price theory course. I could point people to one of my books that's intended as a substitute for that course. But the basic logic is pretty simple. Individuals are making decisions. They're deciding how much iron ore to dig, uh, how many books to write, whatever they're doing. And we want a system where when I make a decision, I the decision it is in my interest to make is reasonably close to the decision it's in our interest to make. And how do you do it? You have a system where the individual who's making a decision bears the costs of that decision, receives the benefits of that decision. Hence, if benefits are larger than cost, it will be to his interest to make the decision. If not, he won't. That's the basic logic of decentralized coordination. And the way it works in a market society is that if I want to produce something, I need inputs. I need, if I am a freelance author, among other things, so I need a cover. Uh, which requires an artist, so I've got to make a deal with the artist. I need various other uh, inputs for what I'm doing. If I'm making a car, I, I need steel. For all of those inputs on the market system, I've got to pay somebody else enough or offer him something else he values enough so that he's willing to do it. So that means that the cost to the worker of spending his time making my cover or spending his time mining iron ore or whatever he is doing has to be compensated in what I pay him. And therefore that cost is transferred to me. When I produce something of value, whether a book or a car, the purchaser is then giving me a price which reflects the value to him of that something. So I'm receiving the benefit. So I'm receiving the benefit, paying the cost. Hence, if benefit is larger than cost, it's in my interest to do it. That's the basic logic of the system at the very simplified level. And there are lots of complications. In particular, there are a set of problems that economists describe as market failure, which are cases where for one reason or another, someone who makes a decision either can't collect the benefit of it, makes a radio broadcast, for example, and can't control who gets it, or some doesn't have to bear the costs or all of the costs. For example, air pollution is a sort of standard example, or have the, my neighbors who have loud parties late at, late at night and don't worry whether or not it's keeping, keeping me up. So it's not a perfect system. We don't have any perfect systems, but it nonetheless is a way of getting decentralized coordination where to at least first approximation, everybody makes, makes the right decision. Uh, and unfortunately, as far as I know, there is no better alternative. Real societies, as we observe them, contain both 
uh, hierarchical structures and decentralized uh, market structures. Uh, and if we think about the societies that we call capitalist, uh, they really have hierarchical structures of two different sorts. First, there are hierarchies within the market. So if you think of an ordinary firm, within the firm, you can think of a firm as a sort of a miniature socialist planned economy. Uh, that is to say that CEO of the firm gives instructions to people through a chain of, of, higher, of, of subordinates, and he then uh, coordinates everything, theoretically, or he and his employees coordinate everything. Uh, but the firm is acting inside the market structure. So if the firm wants to get workers, it's got to offer those workers better terms than they can get anywhere else. If it wants inputs, it's got to pay the sellers of those inputs term an amount that compensate them for either producing them or for not selling them to somebody else. So therefore, the firm in that system, though it's a hierarchical structure, is constrained by the fact that if hierarchy doesn't work, the firm breaks down, the firm goes bankrupt. And if hierarchy works, but for a slightly smaller firm, then slightly smaller firms drive out the larger. On the other hand, if the larger firm does better, you have the opposite happen. And for anybody who's really interested in the underlying economic theory, the classic articles by Ronald Coase called The Nature of the Firm. And if you want to read it as a book instead of an article, uh, it's a book by Oliver Williamson called Market and Hierarchy, which is I found very interesting when I read it. Uh, so that's one form of hierarchy in something like modern America. The other form of hierarchy, however, is government action so that the public school systems are in fact a socialist institution, even though it sounds odd to call them that since we're used to thinking of socialism as a bad term and public schools are a very American institution. But in fact, they are literally socialist. That is a government owns and controls the means of production. And the government does not depend on selling its services to willing providers. On the contrary, uh, the government collects taxes to pay for it. It doesn't even depend on willing attendance since to varying degrees in different states, children are required to go to that school or to that school or some other school that the government approves of. Similarly, the American military is a socialist institution in the literal sense, the tanks and the guns, which are their means of production and the fighter planes and the bombers and the A-bombs all belong to the government. They are funded by, by, by tax money. So you actually have a mixture in a so-called capitalist system of hierarchical institutions within the market and of hierarchical institutions outside of the market. And if you think about real world socialist systems such as the Soviet Union or North Korea uh, or East Germany, they also have a mixture of both hierarchical and non-hierarchical systems that there is typically a black market, an illegal market. Quite often there are some legal markets as well with various restrictions imposed by the government. There are informal markets in favors, which are working sort of like that, although the fact that they're illegal and informal makes it harder to make them function very well. Uh, so you really have both forms in both. And it seems to me that insofar as I can make a useful definition between socialism and capitalism, it's socialism when the top level system that the other things are embedded in is the hierarchy, and it is capitalism when the top level system is the market. And I would like to see a perfectly, an entirely capitalist system in which everything was being produced by voluntary exchange, uh, but uh, the real world systems, what you really have is a system like the US, which has a sizable socialist element, but where most of the economy is being run on the market basis, uh, and a system like say the Soviet Union, when, when, when it was a going concern or North Korea now, where there is certainly some implicit or explicit market arrangements, but the top level, everything else is embedded in, uh, is, a, a, uh, is, is a hierarchical system depending not on voluntary exchange, uh, but on, on compulsion, basically. Uh, and within the market system, you can have a great variety of different ways in which people choose to arrange their lives. You could have workers' co-ops, you can have ordinary hierarchical firms, uh, you can have my own preferred system, which is everybody being a freelancer. Uh, that's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm self-publishing my books. I get somebody to do the cover. Uh, I have my editor in-house because my daughter happens to be a freelance editor. Uh, and then I use Amazon to make the books available to other people. Uh, 
and you you could have any of a variety of structures. Uh, law firms are, I suppose, in a certain sense, workers co-ops, but only with a very small elite group of workers controlling them, and everybody else is an is an employee. Uh, uh, all of those. Uh, why is capitalism better? And ultimately, the answer is that hierarchy doesn't scale. That hierarchy works for a family firm. It works for a football team, more or less, but it doesn't work very well for a national economy. Uh, and in theory, in, in the capitalist system, you have hierarchical system only up to the size where it keeps working as judged by what people are willing to accept as payments for their inputs and what they're willing to pay for its outputs. In a socialist system, the hierarchy is not disciplined in that way. And people who support a socialist system mostly assume that it will be disciplined instead by political mechanisms, uh, by democracy in some societies, by a wise benevolent dictator in the, which some optimists at various times in history have believed in, uh, but by some political mechanism uh, or other. And the uh, political, the problem is, I was talking earlier about market failure. Market failure happens when individuals make decisions where they're not bearing most of the cost to receiving most of the benefits. That is the exception on the market system, although it occurs. It is the normal pattern in the political system. There is no political actor who is uh, either receiving all of the benefits of his action or paying a significant part of the cost. That if you think of the bottom level of democracy, which is the individual voter, if you cleverly, wisely study all issues and vote for the best guy. First, it'll probably have no effect because you're only one voter out of 100 million or so. But if it has an effect, the benefit is shared with the rest of the population of the country, you're getting almost none of it. If you are a judge and you make the wrong decision, uh, the costs go to somebody else. If you set a bad precedent, which could have enormous costs over a long period of time, you never find out and the costs go to other people. If you are a politician and you pass a tariff, the benefits of the tariff go to the industry that's protected, the costs of the tariff go to people who are buying its products at a higher price and to exporters who can't export as much because we're not importing as much, all of those are being imposed on other people. So we don't have any method, at least I don't know of any method, I don't think we've discovered any method by which you can use political mechanisms to get people to make the right decision. And almost always people who are arguing for doing something politically simply assume their conclusion. They say, let us have a government which does X. And what I want to do is to impose on the government, when we're thinking about it, exactly the same constraints I impose on the market. To say under what circumstances will political actors make the right decision or the wrong decision, and unless you've got a good reason to expect them to make the right decision, you have no business assuming that they will. Uh, so that's the problem with all of the proposals to use political action to fix the flaws of the market, which certainly exist, and that they simply take it for granted that the government actor who intervenes will intervene for the general good rather than in order to get reelected, in order to get bribes, or in order to promote those people he likes and not the people he doesn't like or whatever. Uh, the real world systems we observe, as I say, are all a mix. But we do have a good deal of evidence because we can observe multiple cases where you have what start out as very similar societies, one of which is much more capitalist and one of which much more socialist. Uh, and within our lifetime, the obvious pairs are East Germany and West Germany. And East Germany not only worked worse than West Germany, it worked so badly they had to build a wall with armed guards to keep people from losing. We have North Korea and South Korea. We have the contrast between Maoist China and Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, where Taiwan became a modern developed country with the kind of standard of living that you and I are used to. And China under Mao was a place where when things went wrong, 30 million people starved to death during the famine, during the Great Leap Forward. But we've got China actually gives us a second and perhaps equally interesting comparison because all of those are parallels in space, two things that existed at the same time. But in the case of China, we also have the history of the period since Mao died, that when Mao died, China was a dirt poor country. Uh, the elite of the China Communist Party, who as far as I can tell were intelligent and well-intentioned people, 
finally had the opportunity to go outside of China and see what the rest of the world was like. And they discovered to their astonishment that with what they had been told was the best economic system in the world, socialism, China was an extraordinarily poor country in contrast to all of the countries around it that they were able, were able almost all, it was Vietnam, I guess, might have been in the same category, probably not, uh, that they were able to observe. Uh, and they being sent, we have the account of one uh, deputy of premier of China who returned from a visit to England and reported that he had found that a garbage collector in England had several times his income. And he concluded that England would be the perfect communist country if it only had a communist party running it. Uh, it, was, it was a shock to them. And since they were, as far as I can tell, on the whole, honest and well-intentioned people, they started experimenting and tinkering with the system and introducing various things. One, be a long talk if, if, if people were interested, uh, but one of the experiments was having little islands of capitalism inside their socialist system so they could study how capitalism works and figure out what the tricks were that they could adopt to make their system work better. And the islands of capitalism worked so well that the exception swallowed the rule. And by now, China is a little less capitalist than the US, a good deal less free than the US. It did not move to democracy. It is still a communist country politically. It still calls itself socialism with Chinese characteristics, but in fact, stuff is being openly bought and sold. If you go to Shanghai, it doesn't feel very much different from New York or, or Chicago. Uh, so I think those, uh, those experiments show us in a pretty striking fashion uh, that the more capitalist systems work a whole lot better than the more, than the more socialist systems.